Hello and welcome to the TIFO Football Podcast. I'm Joe Devine and today I'm delighted to be joined by Alistair Campbell. Alistair was uh, Tony Blair's press secretary in the late 90s. He was Labour's director of communications in the early 2000s. He is editor-at-large of The New European. You write for the GQ. You are uh, an advisor to the public, uh, to the People's Vote campaign. You've just started a podcast with your daughter Grace, Football, Feminism and Everything in Between. You've published 15 books and also you are a Burnley fan. Yeah. Yeah? I'd say the one consistent thing through all of that is the Burnley bit. It's Not me. just a bandwagon jumper then, no? No, 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 no. I have seen us go from the very top to the very bottom and a long way back again. How many games do you think you've been to? <sighs> I've no idea. Um, How often do you get to go? Pretty much most games. Yeah. Most games. Home and away. Uh, last season, I don't know, missed about eight, maybe? Um, That's a lot of games. Yeah, and... I've been to virtually every ground. There's a few I've not been to because they're new. Um, but, you know, you remember we were... So when I first saw Burnley, we were reigning league champions. And then 25 years later, we needed to win the last game of the season to stay in the league. So I've, I've seen them up and down all the leagues. Uh -huh. I think there's only us and Wolves that can say we've won all four divisional titles. I saw you say that on the G. On the yeah, GQ I think podcast. that's true. You're recycling uh, old content now. I know, but it's like, it's like it is, it is a fact that I... You know, I, I'm, I've never checked. Yeah. I was trying to guess when you said that. So you, it's the only you and Wolves have won all four of yeah. the league divisions. I was thinking Leicester maybe, but no. No, I guess I not. That was my mean, guess. No, I don't think so. Anyway, so yeah, so it means I have been to most places. Mm. What about when you were in government? Did you get to go very often? Yeah, I got to a lot of games. Yeah? Yeah. Is um, that allowed when you're in government? Yeah. I mean, I think it's, I, as far as I was concerned, it wasn't just allowed, it was... I should encourage, I encourage myself because I think it's, I think particularly if you're kind of in a really full on setup, having something to escape to. And, um, and it was, I mean, there was every now and again, Tony Blair would get a bit hacked off saying, you know, what are you going tooting off to another football match for? But it was my way of kind of partly of staying connected. Partly it was a, it was a release. And also, you know, you've got eight hours traveling. You can, you can get through quite a lot of work. I don't think it was very good for my kids. I think I, I think I persuaded myself that it was really great childcare, dragging my sons along to see Burnley at Stockport away. Um, and it isn't? Yeah, well, they're, listen, they're both really passionate about football. Yeah. One of them works in football now. But I, I, I think it was, I think I was kidding myself that it was good childcare. I think taking your kids to football is great, but I suspect that they just spent most of the time listening to me on the phone. Well, listen, I'd love to come back to ask you uh, more questions about other politicians and football a bit okay. later on. But um, I'd quite like to talk to you as well about a couple of political challenges that I think are facing football at the moment and maybe more impactful over the next 10 years. The first one, which is UK specific, is, is Brexit, which I think we can come back to a little bit later. The second, which maybe appeals more to our listeners from around the world, is the influx of investment and money into particularly European football, but also elsewhere, from places like the Persian Gulf, places like the UAE, Qatar, and that extends to the Qatar World Cup as well. And there are various moral conundrums, I think, that come along with, with these sorts of issues. There are suggestions of, um, well, there's a new term, I don't know how new it is, but it's new to me, sports washing is something that, that we hear quite a lot about now. And I wanted to talk to you as someone who previously worked in government here, and also someone who's worked in politics in one, one way or another since then, what you think or what government's role should be in responding to these sorts of things? Because we don't hear too much about it from, in the UK at least, which is, there's an argument to say that's a good thing as well. But if I may, if I could start by asking you personally what your views are on Qatar hosting a World Cup, because there's wonderful arguments on both sides. Yeah, I mean, I think the... If you'd have said, I don't know, 20 years ago that there'd be a World Cup in Russia and then there'd be a World Cup in Qatar, you'd say, well, no, that's not going to happen. And I think you can, you know, the, the, you can make an argument that... I think it's really difficult, this, because if you take, you take the Russian World Cup or the Winter Olympics, was Putin using those to project a different image to the world? You bet. He definitely was. Has there been any improvement in life for Russians as a result of them having the World Cup? I don't know. Has there been any sense of a change in Russia's attitude to the world, which 
may have been something that people were looking to get out of that. I don't know. Um, is it is it is it good that you can genuinely say that that the globalization of football means exactly that that football is is going to the whole world i think that is that is prob that is a good thing um i think what's happened down the years i think fifa is it's really interesting this because it's like it's a bit like the i i think sometimes I think of the pharmaceuticals industry whereas you know virtually everybody needs them at some certainly at some stage in their life there's nobody's going to get through life without needing medication of some sort at some point and yet the pharmaceuticals industry has a really bad image and has a really bad reputation football is without doubt the most dominant the most popular to my mind the best sport in the world and yet fifa has pretty consistently, sustainedly had a very bad reputation. And I think what happens is, if you like, the, the good goal of seeking to take the World, the, the, the world Cup around the world and not just have it sort of pinging backwards and forwards between, you know, half a dozen countries that we know can put it on, um, is, 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 is clouded because of the reputation over the year and, you know, in particular, the, the corruption allegations that have swirled around for an awful long time. Um, so I think that, that, that's why I'm not, you know, I'm not kind of one of those who says, oh, it shouldn't go there, it shouldn't go there. I think it should go everywhere. Um, I think spreading that, you look at what's happened, I've just come back from Paris, as you know, been out for the Women's World Cup. Um, now, the Women's World Cup is still at that stage where it's, in a sense, it's having to establish itself in the established football world. Yeah. Uh, it would therefore, to my mind, make very little sense to take it somewhere other than one of those countries that you know can put it on. But one day, I suspect that once that is established, it then goes on to, on to another level. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting to me that you, you, know, you talk about the idea of taking the World Cup to different places. I mean, FIFA gets a lot of, a lot of flack, and Sepp Blatter in particular. One of the things I think that Sepp Blatter did, which is maybe under-recognised is that he made a big effort to spread football around the world. He did things like, you know, he uh, recognised Palestine as, a, as an of official, you know, official footballing FA and they became part of the, of the structure for the first time. And I think, you know, as, as many things probably in politics as well work, there are good intentions behind many of these issues. You make a good point also when you say, did uh, Vladimir Putin not use the World Cup to sports wash Russia, you didn't say sports wash, I did. Um, yeah, probably. But where, where is the red line? Because we know with Qatar, for example, that there are quite severe human rights um, violations, particularly revolving around migrant workers who are there under the kafala system, which is supposedly being eased. You know, it, it has maybe a name only. Um, I think I saw a statistic the other day that said that in the last 10 years, 1,400 Nepalese migrant workers have died in pretty terrible, horrible conditions living there, a large number of whom have died of sudden cardiac arrest or heart attacks. All of this is associated with overwork. Many people uh, aren't paid. Many people have their passports taken away from them. They're not granted exit visas. They often are in massive debt because they sell land at home or they take their children out of school to be able to afford to go to places like Qatar in the first place on the promise of a a good wage, which yeah. then isn't delivered on. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's, you know, Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch have described it in many cases as forced labour. Um, and of course, there are different issues with Russia, for example. There are different issues with all countries around the world. This is the what aboutery, which always comes up whenever you have this conversation, particularly with, you know, fans of certain clubs in the Premier League, you, you end up in this situation. But presumably there have to be red lines somewhere. And I... I don't know what to think about it anymore because well, everything you said about Qatar is right, but at the same time, is is it acceptable for the uh, the global community to have a, an event like this, which is associated with pride and splendor and joy, in in this environment? Well, the thing you see, I think this is where I'm trying to imagine what Set Blatter would say. Um, I think you're right that he would he would say. That he's um, oh sorry my hand. 
Sorry, sorry, I didn't mean yeah, to. Yeah, I do that. I do. I do talk my hands. Sorry. Uh, so he would definitely say, I think, that his le- he would like, I think, his legacy to be, I've taken football to parts of the world, and it's developed in parts of the world that otherwise wouldn't have um, uh, wouldn't have, have, have developed as they have. And I think he can certainly look at parts of Asia and parts of Africa and, and say that with some conviction. Um, and I think that what, he, what I think he would say in relation to something like the Russia Qatar um, is that, in a sense, using the leverage of football to drive change. Now, that's why I say about Russia what judgment can you make about? the change that comes afterwards. Um, And it's quite hard sitting here and thinking, well, you know, you had British citizens getting put at risk and one dying in the streets of Salisbury um, or stuff that's going on in Ukraine. And you can start, there's lots of things that you can say, well, clearly it didn't have that positive political impact. And I think what the football world does at that point is to say, oh, okay, but we're not, we're not politics. Yeah. We're not pure politics. Um, so I think I think with with uh, with Qatar, I think you've got to. I think it, a lot depends on on what in terms of the tournament, what actually happens. Because what you're saying when you talk about red lines for the for the global community, whatever they may be, um, what would it? Let me ask you a question. What would it take, for example, for if the home nations qualify? What does it take for them not to go? I don't know. This is why, I mean, I'm not decided on, on the answer. I, yeah, I, you know, and I, I suspect... I mean, you think something about, enormous, right? Yeah. Something that so. isn't happening now. I can't imagine, yeah, I I can't imagine so. something that would stop England from going to the World Cup. No. And I think the, the this, this whole debate about, you know, the number of times that people would say to me, I wish we could just take the politics out of sport. Well, you can't because, you know, there's a reason why uh, the, some of the Gulf countries have wanted to get involved in, not just in British sport, not just in football clubs, but, you know, in, the, in, 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 in industry, in, in parts of culture, in our culture and economy and society more broadly. And... Again, I think you've got to be very careful about saying our default mindset should be to kind of whack up all the barriers to that. What, what is the reason? The as, reason they want to do it? it? Yeah. Uh, I think it's to project a sense of their, of their, you used the words earlier about power and prestige and their, and their belonging in this world and their belonging in a globalised economy. Um, and then I think within that you've got, you know, you've you've got very competitive. Uh, you've got com- countries that are competing with each other. Yeah. In terms of their their relations with the with the rest of the world, and I think that what the I mean it's funny because I, I I I often think of as as a Burnley fan we're quite lucky, in that we have you know if, if I look at the board at Burnley they're pretty they're all Burnley fans, they've all grown up as Burnley fans. Mm. I mean, not all of them live in the area because some of them have moved to other parts of the country. Um, if at some point in the future they decided to sell the club to, um, and it's not impossible, but would, how would I feel if they decided to sell the club to a, a foreign owner? And I speak as somebody who is contrary to the Theresa May view of the world that if you're, uh, what is it, if you're, Citizen, of, what did you call us all? People who believe in other countries, you're a citizen of nowhere. I don't know. Um, but I, I, I would feel so. I see myself as an internationalist, mm. but I feel quite troubled if Burnley was not owned by people that I felt were genuinely driven by the interests of Burnley Football Club as Burnley Football Club. Um, when I see, so when I see, I don't know why they do it. I mean, when you get a player come in. And he wears the shirt. He wears the shirt for the photo call, and he holds the scarf up. I don't mind it because he's a player, and that's what he's there for. When a new manager comes in, and he they do the same. When it's an owner, I kind of want to know that they don't really need to do that. Mm. Um, 
But it's not just the Premier League now. You go, you know, the, there are there are people with money around the world looking at the lower league clubs as well because it's a kind of... And the thing, what I thought you meant by sport washing was the idea of actually, you know, literally laundering great wadges of money through the ownership of football clubs. I didn't quite mean that. You no. meant it as a kind of image reputation. I thing. am researching that, but it turns out that a football club is a, is a, terrible, uh, is a terrible model for, for money laundering. So I don't think there's that much of it. Certainly not at the top level. What I mean is, yeah, reputation right. laundering. And I think that's, you know, you said a moment ago that you think these countries are, um, you know, they want to show to the world that they're part of a, of a global economy. And I, you know. But if you look at, just take a. But there are red lines for those things. That, that, you know, like that, that, you know, there are countries under economic sanctions because they don't pass whatever the sure. universal um, value. I don't know what universal values, I don't know what they are. But whatever the universal values are, certain countries don't pass these red lines and therefore they aren't part of the global economy. So when it comes to football, do you see what I mean? Like, yeah, I do. I do. And, that's and I'm not going to push you to tell me what they are because I'm, I think they're, you know. <laughs> I think you'll lose some of your listeners if we stick on that one for too long. But that's, I think that's that, my aim. I think that the, um, no, I do get, I, I completely t- take your point. I think that's where this, this problem um, arises in terms of, you see, because my interactions with FIFA, um, they're fairly limited. But for example, when we were, as the government was supporting the FA in, in a bid to get the, the World Cup. Um, and I can remember when Seth Blatter came to Downey Street and it was like, you know, all this stuff comes through in advance, you know, you, you must call him Mr. President and, you know, it has to be a red carpet and all this sort of stuff. And it's like, so on the one hand, they want to be treated like, political, almost like a head of state, yeah. the state of football. And on, on the other hand, they don't really want to be, to be under the same sort of governance as, uh, as people like that do, in re- if you like, in the real world of politics. So I guess they've, for a long time, they've kind of tried to and have been quite successful in having their cake and eating it. Yeah, I mean, I'm reminded of when Gianni Infantino, who's the current head of FIFA, said one week, well, football and politics don't mix and it's not our responsibility to be involved in this. And then the next week stands in front of the G8 and says, well, I think actually maybe if Qatar share their World Cup with the UAE, that would ease tensions in in the Gulf. And that, as you say, that, that presumably, I can't imagine a circumstance of having your cake and eating it greater than that, right? Yeah, they're cl- cl- clearly involved in in things and machinations of things much more than they would like to say. But the issue for UEFA and for FIFA to a certain extent as well now, and this kind of brings us onto the <clears throat> the second phase of this. You know, the Qatar World Cup is part of it, but also investment in in football as well. And Manchester City is the is the is the perfect example of this. And after Der Spiegel published um, some of the football leaks information that came out earlier in the year and last year. Uh, Kaldun Al Mubarak, who is the uh, the chairman of Manchester City, allegedly said in an email that he would rather spend tens of millions of pounds destroying UEFA than ever submit to uh, the will of an organisation. And when you have a power base supporting a club which is a, effectively state money from one of the richest countries in the world, UEFA are meaningless, <laughs> right? I mean, if it comes down to to lawyers and how much money you have, if you have a sport in which the overarching uh, governing body uh, can't dictate the rules to something which is an organisation which is supposed to be underneath it because they're yeah. significantly wealthier, then doesn't that pose like a, a very serious question about football's ability to manage itself? It does. Um, but I think it's interesting, though, that, that, that it strikes me that that, um, that episode is far from over. Well, I mean, that, so FIFA have said that it's not expanding, right? The, the World Cup. And I, was, I wasn't expecting that because I think there was a... Well, look, there's a there's a lot of stuff that isn't necessarily. Um... No, I'm talking about the Manchester City, the fair financial fair. Oh, I see. Stuff. Sorry, yeah. yes, no, that isn't over. Sure, um, I'm talking about that. But how how do you proceed if you're UEFA in that circumstance? You know that you have to impose sanctions, but you also know that you can't do that. What what? Well, they've done it. Chelsea have just been, you know, the the, the, the you know the, that that's going to hit Chelsea hard. Sure, but um, Roman Abramovich is not in the UK. Roman Abramovich doesn't have the same kind of wealth or influence that um, the owners. No, of he doesn't. City but do. it's interesting if you go back, if you wind back a bit to when Roman Abramovich first took over Chelsea, and I can remember that as being quite a big moment. 
in football and, and it was like front page news and Chelsea and all that stuff. And uh, now I don't know Abramovich, but he, he he's clearly the, the, the Abramovich story has gone through, you know, various chapters and he's now, as you say, barely in the country. And I think he's not, in Israel, isn't he? Right. And that's not out of choice. Yeah. So now is that government? Is that football? Is that Salisbury? Well, I don't know. I don't know. But I mean, so my, the, and then what, what, what happens at the end of that? Does he, does there come a point where he says, oh, you know, I can't be bothered with this anymore? I don't know. Um, I do, I mean, the Manchester City thing is, I was up at their training ground or the, the Etihad training campus, as it's called. The huge complex. It is yeah. extraordinary. It is extraordinary. And there's a part of you that says, wow. Isn't it amazing? Because, you know, and the, the, for example, Vicky Kloss, who does all the com- communications, who's, who I like a lot, she's great. She's been with them since they were, as she says herself, you know, she was doing the press job when it was like, you know, the Manchester Evening News and the Oldham Chronicle would, if, would turn up for the press conferences. And now it's like this, you know, Pep got this extraordinary sort of media centre and Pep does his press conferences there and there's interest from all over the world. And, of course, there's a big part of you that says, you know, because I can remember my first ever away game was at Manchester City at Main Road. We lost 4-1 and some tosser stole my bobble hat. Never, And I went to complain to a policeman and he, he could not have been more disinterested. <laughs> uh, I was about nine. So I think that as part of you thinks, you know, when I was in France at the weekend, I was doing this television programme last night and uh, with this guy, uh, Bernard Pivot, who's a kind of intellectual and but loves football. And we were talking about Brexit and he said, yeah, well, whatever happens with Brexit, whatever happens with Brexit, we in Europe know that the two Liverpools, the two Manchesters, Tottenham, Arsenal, Chelsea, these teams are going to be part of European football forever. These are the big, you know, he was like, his passion for Britain was about our football teams. And so that's good. I like it that, you know, we've got these kind of great uh, footballing names. What I don't like is the idea that, you know, tomorrow it could be Newcastle, the next day it could be Southampton. I just think that the, so financial fair play has is, is, is got to mean something. Um, I, d- I can't pretend to know the ins and outs of the Man City stuff. All I know is that as that unfolds, clearly the long-term interests of football in this country have got to be at, at the heart of that decision. Yeah. Um, I think the question is whether or not that will be the case. Yeah, and then, and then, and then you know, I guess you could argue at that point, are there red lines that have been crossed? I don't know. I don't know. I do think it's it's. Uh, I do think it's changing fast. I think you've. I think football has got to be very very careful not to. You know when you're watching sometimes at the weekend you might be just sort of sitting on the sofa and you're kind of just flicking through the channels or whatever. You know you can get football from all around the world quite easily. And if I'm flicking through, I mean like Rangers Celtic, I'm on it. Okay, but it might as you know. It's often it won't be Rangers Celtic. It'll be because they have to. It'll be St Johnston Dundee United, and the first thing you notice is that it's a half-empty stadium. And as a as a viewer, and the sports industry is about you know getting as many eyeballs onto TV screens and laptops as the rest as they can. It's the first thing that will direct you actually to go to the next channel Mm. and i think once you know if if i think if you think back to when this current sort of football revolution began one of the big parts of it was when we started to get italian football on i mean you're really young right but i i can remember when um i I was always fascinated by this when i was a kid growing up why was queen's park rangers the only team that ever got on the news and it was like every saturday night on the news it would have the football results and then it would have a clip from Queen's Park Rangers. You know what I mean? No. The reason was that Queen's Park Rangers, Loftus Road, was just around the corner from the TV centre. So they would go and get a clip from a Queen's Park Rangers game and they would use that to illustrate the football news that night. Yeah. Now you can sit on your sofa on a Saturday afternoon and by six o'clock 
you can see every goal in any football league ground in the country. You don't even have to be on your sofa. No, you can be on your phone. You can be anywhere you want. So that's, I'm showing my age there, aren't I? The, so, <laughs> the sofa, the QPR reference and the sofa. So that has, but what that means is that the people who are going to be watching those Leighton Orient goals and Barnet and whatever it might be, they can get it, right? But they're going to be the people who really are interested in that. Your, av- your general audiences are going to dissipate and dissipate and dissipate. And if you do get to a situation where, you know, it's already happening, okay, they can fill most Premier League grounds are pretty full most weeks. And I think that's going to go on for some time. But I, I've noticed in my, I mean, I'm a, I am a football fanatic, right? I love watching football. But I've noticed myself becoming, I'll still kind of go to the end of the world to see a Burnley game. But I'll give you an example. I could have gone to the Champions League final. And in the end, I decided not to. Um, partly a logistical thing. I was, I was in Asia and I'd come back and dive, you know, fly and all that stuff. But a few years ago, there's no way I wouldn't have gone to it. Mm. And I think I'm just becoming a bit more picky and a bit more choosy. And because think, you can. No, but I think a lot of people are becoming more picky and more choosy because they can't. So people are actually just saying, I can't afford it. I can't afford to go to the Emirates. Uh, I can't afford to go to Tottenham. I can't afford to renew my season ticket. Can't afford to Sky Sports. Yeah, exactly. So that, I think, is, that's where if I was football, I would just, I'd be very, very wary about that because I think things can change very, very quickly. I think people can have a sense of something being really, really good and that can endure for a while. The minute that changes, and I think sometimes the football industry itself, and I'm not saying it's not an amazing success story because it is, but I think sometimes they are a bit complacent about how quickly that could unravel if, um, if they're not careful. Mm. I guess one final point on the sort of um, the sports washing thing as, as well. Let's say, you know, you mentioned you're lucky to be a Burnley fan and that everyone on the board is, is a Burnley fan. And that's, that's a, it's a great thing. And that, that is lucky. You know, my, some of my family are Norwich fans and I feel equally that they're yeah, yeah. lucky in the same sort love of way. You know? Exactly. Who doesn't love Delia? That's, yeah. that's amazing. Um, but if you are a Manchester City fan, or let's say that tomorrow uh, Burnley was, was bought by a large organisation from, uh, from outside of the UK with uh, things to be concerned about, let's say. What, what do you do if, if you're in that situation? Or what does a Manchester City fan do now who might be concerned about some of the moral implications of watching? What position? Because often you find people, and I try, try to be careful not to cross this line of uh, a- accusing people of um, essentially supporting it by uh, continuing to be a fan. You know, there's no expectation from, from, from us that everyone who supports Manchester City should, should stop for whatever reason. But Some have, though. Some have. Some have. What, what I know, do you I know, do if you're I've, in that I've situation? Got a, I've got a, um, a friend who's a Watford fan. And you know, I'm not going to put Watford in the same sure. league as Man City, but he's given up. Because of the whole kind of, you know, constantly getting rid of managers and the feeder club thing. And yeah. it just feels it's not, it doesn't feel it's the same Watford. Now, I think for me, it'd be very hard to imagine I couldn't be a Burnley fan. Yeah. I can't, it would have to be. You asked me before what, what yeah, my I know. Like, and what, and what I, guess I'm, I guess I'm, I guess I'm happy really that, that we haven't had to face that yeah. yet. But what if you did? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. What if I kept asking you? What if you keep asking me? I just keep saying I don't know. And then we get really bored. Um, And also, you know, I guess, I think there is something, I mean, everybody thinks their football club's special and and football clubs are special, but there there is something very, very special about Burnley. I can express it in all sorts of different ways. Please do. I mean, the fact that so many of our former players still live in the area, even though they're not from there. Uh, I mean, the team of the of the seventies, the, they're, they're scattered around Burnley and the surrounding area. Loads of them. I bet you we have the highest proportion of former players going to games. Uh, the I think the fan the fan base, the fact that we're you know it's a small town surrounded by loads of really big clubs. 
And yet we've always just, you know, apart from the, even the really bad years, we, we could still get a few thousand in. Mm. Um, and like, you know, 20,000, that, that, that's like, you know, that's a third, almost a third of the local population. And I know they're not all coming from Burnley, mm-hmm. but a lot of them are. Um, I think the fact that the, the club has that sense of, it sort of means something. It feels like something, you know? Whereas I think, you know, I do meet, People from other clubs, I remember when the whole Vincent Tan, Malky Mackay thing was going on, I've got some very good friends who are, who are Cardiff fans, and again, one of them gave up. Um, I think I think with, with, with Arsenal, I mean, I'd certainly know, you know friends of my kids who have sort of seen themselves as Arsenal fans, but now because they feel completely priced out of it, they're very distant Arsenal fans. Jeremy Corbyn, maybe? Oh, does he go? He goes a bit, doesn't he? I don't know. Does he? I don't know. I, don't I hear know. he's a fan. I... I've seen him in a scarf. I think he, I think he does go a bit. Sure. Um, yeah. I've never bought that thing that football, I, I, I can't stand the way that football fans sort of say, oh, look at him. It's almost like unless you go every game, you're not a real fan. I've heard you say that. Well, I kind of think that. I've heard that. you say that about three <laughs> times. <laughs> in fact, I was going to bring that I do think up. that. I do think that. Oh, dear. About... I think there is a way you have to support a team, but this idea that politicians, yeah, they get they're kind of damned if they do and the damned if they because don't because they use it. It's because it's because and you know sure it's because it's it's a thing, you know. And this was part of New Labour as well. It's certainly a part. Of, I mean, David Cameron said that he supported West Ham by accident on TV. Yeah, it's it's. Well, used I'm not going to. David Cameron is not a proper football fan. No, no, he, sure, he would sure. say that. Oh, yeah, I think yeah, I think everyone knows that, but. They use it as a, as a kind of uh, as an as access to normal people they who they are, who do, many of them aren't. You know? Yeah, no, but and that's s- what people dislike about it. It's not so much that they don't go or they're not most proper people fans. Care, to be yeah. honest, well, okay, but people who take an interest. What I find difficult about that is the level of inauthenticity surrounding yeah, politicians talking about football, which is what I find refreshing about you because you clearly like Burnley and you aren't lying about it. And I love football. I do love football, but I think, for example, you take somebody like. Um, uh, I mean, Gordon Brown, right? Mm-hmm. Now, Gordon Brown, uh, he really does like talking about football, okay? Who does Gordon Brown support? I think he's Wraith. And, uh, I mean, I think, if you, I think if you had a lie detector on him, you'd, I think a bit Man United would okay. come out, I've got to sure, say, right. I think. But, um, I mean, he grew up as a Wraith Rovers fan. Yeah. Um, but but he, he follows football. Tony follows football. Who does Tony support? He supports Newcastle. Okay. But he wouldn't, Does he actually, though? But he wouldn't classify himself. He doesn't support Newcastle like I support Burnley. No. Newcastle is the score he's going to look out for. I wish I had tried to find footage of him pretending to, though, so I could... But yeah. you can't. You no, can't. Because he, always, he went to the... I'll tell you what you could find. He went to the... Was it 4-0 when United beat Newcastle at Wembley in the Cup final? No, they battered them. And he went with Bertie Ahern. Right. Because Bertie Ahern is a big football fan. Okay. And he's a United fan. Yeah. Um, in fact, I went to a game with him, Newcastle, Manchester United at St. James's when the Newcastle won 5 0. Right. Shinola got an amazing free kick. Um, so, no, but I think it's, it's. So, I'll tell you who I really liked in football, in politics as a football fan. And I'll tell you why as well. And that was Tony Banks, who was our sports minister. He was MP for West Ham. Mm-hmm. Okay. That was his constituency. He was a massive Chelsea fan. Right, okay. He never hit it. <laughs> sure. He never hit it. But that's great, right? I totally get that. And that and works that, in politics as fine. well, doesn't it? What, yeah, and I, I think it does, because I think it's the point you were making about being inauthentic. But I'll tell you what's really hard is when you're like, say you have, um, say England, like here we are in the Women's World Cup. Um, when it, if, if England progress, say, to the, to the final, um, whoever is the prime minister at that time, Sure. But let's say, for the sake of argument, that it's Theresa May. Um, she'd be under pressure to go to that. Yeah. And on the one... So then people would say, if she doesn't go, oh, she doesn't care about women's football, which she probably doesn't. Yeah, that's a tough one. Okay. But if she does go, people will say, oh, look at her jumping on the bandwagon. Yeah. So it's, what I, like I say, it's damned if you do, damned well, if you Well, I don't know. I, I don't feel like people criticise politicians for going to, if England get through to the final, as you say, uh, I think a head of state being present Makes sense. I don't head think of, head of government. Will, the Queen head of is head of state. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Good little excuse, constitutional excuse education me. here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think uh, the head of government being present, and indeed the head of state, if the Queen wants to go, would uh, would be acceptable. I don't think anyone criticises them, but I think it's just. I think it's. But just people would say, state. believe me, they would. Mm. They would say, 
reflected glory. Da, da. And sometimes it's justified. There's a great picture when France won the, the World Cup for the first time. There's a fantastic picture where <laughs> Jack Chirac, then the president, he, he virtually grabs the trophy yeah. to make it look like he's kind of, you know, part of the team. Yeah. Uh, now, as it happens, Chirac is quite, you know, he follows football a bit. Uh, there was a great picture of Macron um, at one of the, uh, was it the final? It was certainly, it might be the final, but there's a, a picture of him from the back. France scored and he, he sort of leaps out. He's got this sort of immaculate white shirt on and his arms are outstretched. Mm. And it's a really, really good photo. Now, is he sitting there thinking, and he's a Marseille fan, right? Uh, but is he thinking, I'm the, uh, I'm the president of France and it looks like we're going to win the World Cup and I want to be associated with it? Or is he thinking, we've scored a goal and I'm jumping out of my seat? I mean, if you see some of the stuff of me watching football, I cannot control myself. I mean, some of my commentaries for Claret's player are ridiculously I biased. Watched some of that this morning. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I and I have regularly been asked to calm down in press boxes, and that's what happens with football. Football's the only thing that can do that to me. So I think, and I think the other one the, sometimes as well, you get um, say MPs if a football club is in difficulty, financial difficulty, say, or if there's some big scandal going on, and the MP is expected to have a view or expected to be able to help. Now, it, it's important at that point for the community to think that their MP, whether they're a football fan or not, has the ability and the capacity to help that club. Or at so, least know the names of the players or something. I think that's kind of up to them, isn't it? It's like... Well, just to, just to appear to or appear to, it would be showing an interest in the local community. Yeah, I think so. I think so. But I don't, I, you know, I, I really hate talking about football to people who don't like football. You know, I, w- I wouldn't enjoy, I don't enjoy, if I went for a game, somebody said, you know, let's say Burnley were playing somewhere and the local MP says to me, do you want to go to the game? Um, unless they really like football, I won't enjoy it. Mm-hmm. Will you go though? I tend to go in the away end, so probably not. Probably not. Can I talk to you about Brexit? Yeah. If we can make it about football, though. Yeah. How's it going to affect football? I mean, tier two sports visas, details aside. Well, the, look, one of, the, one of the reasons why I think Brexit is such as a disaster is because the honest question is we don't know. Um, and it depends what sort of Brexit it's going to be. Funny enough, my, my son, who was a... I said he works in uh, football data and analytics, and he's got a he's got a guy who works for him who um, University College of Football Business, which started at Burnley and it's degree level sports stuff, and they're now based at Wembley in the Etihad. Um, and this guy, this uh, guy, he did his dissertation on the impact of Brexit uh, on football, and I can't remember. Why I can't remember the sort of the, the the underpinning of his argument, but his basic conclusion was that it's going to be much worse for the kind of the lower leagues because of a kind of trickle down effect. So in, in other words, look if Cristiano Ronaldo of his day wants to play in in England and a club wants to buy, I, I suspect that's going to happen. Okay, I think it's going to be much more down where you don't quite have that weight, you don't quite have that pull within the system. Um, that makes sense. I mean, there's, there's one thing I think <clears throat> that I think we, if Brexit goes through, I think the only thing that we can rely on is that the UK will no longer be part of the, um, the economic area. And I think there is a FIFA exemption for countries who are part of the EEA whereby they are allowed to sign players who are between the ages of 16 and 18 if they're moving between those countries. Yeah. And when you start to look at the names of players who the UK has benefited from arriving under that legislation... Big names. Big names. There's Fa- uh, Fabregas is one of them. Yeah. Pogba is another one, for yeah. example, the first time round is another yeah. one, for example. And I, unless that is something which is both out of the EU's control and out of the UK's control, regardless of what happens, because I think one of the arguments is if Brexit goes through... The UK government will be more, theoretically more in charge of immigration, therefore will make allowances so that it isn't, doesn't affect football. But unless FIFA changed the rules on that one, that's not going to make any difference, right? No. Also, I, th- I think the other uh, broader, more general point is that 
I mean, I'm not comparing football to the National Health Service, but if you think, for example, that a lot of European Union nurses and doctors have decided to leave anyway because they just feel it says something new and different about the country and what sort of image we are projecting to the world, then there's no reason why that shouldn't affect the way that people in sport think about us as well. In the lower leagues, maybe, right? I think even do you think anyone? Do you think a Premier a, a, a footballer who is going to be bought by a Premier League club is going to it, probably it, not. even with regards to the to the rise in racism, for example? Do you think a player, given given uh, it, the level of racism in other European leagues as well, do you think a player is going to turn down opportunity to move to the Premier no, League because no, but, of that? No, but uh, so like this TV program I did in France last night, we were talking about football, yeah, um, but we also talked about Brexit, and and I saw on social media this morning one of the clips they put out. The caption when I was talking for the debate that we were having at that point was Brexit is the United Kingdom a country in decline. Now, my point is that once that kind of sense starts to develop, you know, there was a time when if you were a footballer and you talk about, you know, you'd say, would you ever think about going to play in Italy? That was like the place of the moment for a period. And people like Dennis Law did go and play there. And then for a time, it was Spain. And for a long time, it has been England and the Premier League. And that's where a lot of the best players in the world want to be. I'm simply saying that that sense of decline, if it happens, which I'm afraid I think it will, um, that can affect everything because it affects the way that people think about other countries. So it's like a perception issue. Well, it's like a, it's like a, is that a place you really kind of champion the bit to go? And okay, I'm not pretending that money wouldn't be a huge factor. Um, and prestige of the clubs, right? Or the yeah, history. Yeah. Like you said, you know, earlier, the, the, the person you set, saw in France. Yeah, he said did. You... He did. And, and it's true that, you know, names like Liverpool and Manchester United and, and Arsenal and, you know, these are big, big names in the. It's the home of football. Well, there's all that. I don't think I don't think a kind of young Italian growing up or a young Moldovan sort of budding superstar is going to think too much about that. I think they will think about you know at the moment. It's it's quite interesting with France, for example. So you've got PSG, um, who are clearly you know we're back to the point about the the kind of money involved. Um, they're they're a current sporting phenomenon within France, but. You know, in England, you have, we talk about a top six, um, but you've got to go, if, you, if, you, if you, look, you look at a map of France, okay, you take London and how many big clubs there are in London. Yeah. Paris has got PSG. Yeah. You know, we go, every, every summer we go down to this, the same region in, in, in France. It's about two hours inland from Marseille. The big football team in that area two hours north of Marseille, is Marseille. Mm. Uh, because there aren't that many big clubs. Yeah. Now, my point is that with, if you were to look at the other leagues, I'm, I've always been very, very surprised why the German league isn't more attractive to younger players coming through other countries. I think, to be honest, a lot of it's about the language. Uh, and it's also because the Germans are very, you know, they there is a strategic direction to their football that they want the league to develop the best German players, and they're very, very good at it. But I could, I could, I could envisage post-Brexit, um, if, if, if we do go into decline in that general sense, I could envisage Germany uh, and Spain becoming seen as the two footballing superpowers yeah. in, the league, in their leagues in a way that at the moment it's England. What's funny about it, though, I think, is that it's kind of, we're getting to the stage where the home nation of each uh, of each of these leagues <clears throat> is, is, apart from people who are from there, is kind of more and more irrelevant. Really, I mean, Germany, for example, with its fifty plus one law, makes makes the kind of money that is available in the Premier League difficult. Yeah, uh, Spain obviously is a, is a is a different thing, but with the division between the top two clubs and every, everything yeah. else, that makes it difficult as well. Yeah. Again, and of course, I mean, the elephant in the room is a, is a European Super League, which. Yeah doesn't care about Brexit, doesn't care about any of these other issues in, this, in the same way, necessarily. Um, are, are you okay for time? Can I ask you? A few minutes. A okay. few minutes. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask you uh, one question. We spoke about it outside, actually, about mental health. Yeah. I watched your um, GQ podcast with uh, 
with Troy Deeney. Oh, yeah. And I found it very interesting. I said to you before that I've, you know, heard that when you left um, government, that was a difficult period for you, leaving a very intense time of work. And presumably that that is the same for, for footballers, right? And I would have thought more, is, is enough being done to ensure that players who are leaving have the kind of support to not spend all of their money and not, you know... Well, I mean, I I can't remember the stat, but there is an extraordinary stat about divorce rates of professional sportsmen when they leave, when they stop uh, performing. Um, there's a, you know, with American footballers, uh, the money thing where people just kind of can't, they, they suddenly go from, uh, they're, they're earning a lot and then suddenly they're not earning a lot, but they, they haven't really learned how to how to spend and how not to spend. Um, so I think all of these issues, uh, but you know, you, in in when you say is is uh, is enough being done, I think if you were to ask Troy Dean that question, he'd he kind of I think he'd wonder what what if anything was being done because I think what happens with with footballers they're uh, they're attached to clubs, and then when they're no longer attached to clubs, they're no longer attached to clubs, and they become. I'm always amazed with. I think I talked to him about this. I'm always amazed how few close friendships emerge from I think I think if you've that's why I mentioned the thing about the Burnley team of the 70s and my, my mate Paul Fletcher who he and I you know we're very good mates and we've written a, a novel together and he he sees all the old Burnley players all the time and they all go on little holidays and all sorts of stuff I doubt that will go on in 20 years time uh, part of the internationalization um, but I think no I think when players give up I think it's hard, and I think it's I think that I think it's probably harder than than it used to be because their life is easier in a way. In other words, they get a lot more money than they used to. Um, so therefore, there's an assumption they're going to be fine. They're going to be able to look after themselves. But I think replacing that replacing that sense of purpose that you have as being a professional athlete, I think that's very hard. So I I suspect I think I think the sport's getting better at it. But I think if you if you say you know what's in place to help, I bet it's not much. Mm. Alistair Campbell, thank you so much for coming My in. My pleasure. I really appreciate. It. I would encourage people as well to listen to football, feminism, and everything in between. Thank you. It's 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 really very good, and also the GQ interviews as well. Did you, did you enjoy the Carragher one? I, mean, I think Carragher was my favourite so far. I did. I've I've enjoyed them all. I enjoyed the Carragher one, as I said to you outside, because I quite like personally hearing footballers' political views. But there are other reasons to enjoy it as well. What I loved about him was just, I just love that. I mean, to, to have that passion for football and still have it when he's not playing, I think it's just, I also love the way he says Burnley. <laughs> which, which you say Burnley, several times in the podcast. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Thank you, my pleasure. Really appreciate it.